Welcome to CRE Success, the podcast, where we help people working in commercial real estate achieve their professional goals. Check us out online at cresuccess.co forward slash podcast. And now here's your host, Darren Krakowiak. Hi there. Welcome to episode eight of CRE Success, the podcast. My special guest today, Gab Aguillon. Gab is the director of BRM Projects and BRM Real Estate. BRM finds, creates, and delivers workspaces that support and nurture their people. And I've been really impressed with the way that Gab and his team have created really great client loyalty with all of the clients that they work with. And I think that if you are a leader that's looking to build a great culture, or if you are a service professional who's wanting to generate more loyalty with your customers, then you're going to be able to take away a number of important lessons from what Gab and I talk about today on this episode. Now, yesterday I started the seven keys of success in commercial real estate by going live on LinkedIn and YouTube and also on Facebook. And what I've decided to do is record that live content and package it up as some bonus episodes and highlights from those live sessions are now going to be appearing in your podcast feed from next week. So if you see a few bonus episodes, that's what that is. It's the seven keys to success. Of course, you are very much welcome to join me live. That means you've got the opportunity to ask questions. It also means that you'll receive the additional resources that we're sending out for free. I've set up a new landing page for that. It's cresuccess.co forward slash keys, K-E-Y-S, keys. Just go to that landing page, register your interest, and you'll receive all of the information about the seven keys to success in commercial real estate. That's cresuccess.co forward slash keys. I'll be speaking to Gab in just 30 seconds. Now the world of work has changed, everyone's looking for new ways to add flexible working into their plans and portfolios. Hub Australia is the national expert in premium flexible workspaces that offer five-star hospitality service. Hub Australia is already partnering with leading developers, Brookfield and Amalgamated Property Group to deliver the future of work for their tenants. Head to hubaustralia.com to learn more about Australia leading flexible workspace experts. And now it's time for the interview on CRE Success, the podcast. Gab, welcome to CRE Success, the podcast. Thank you, Darren. Pleasure to be here. Gab, at the start of every interview, I always ask our guests to step into the virtual elevator and deliver their elevator pitch. So Gab, who are you? Darren, your lift makes me laugh. It's pretty funny. I'm in a lot of lifts uh, in the CVD in in Melbourne. I love listening to your podcast. So thanks for the opportunity here. I'm Gab from BRM Projects. We help companies find and design workspaces. Many of our clients are not-for-profits and professional services companies, typically 20 to 200 staff. And BRM knows how to help companies relocate. So for about 10 to 12 years, we've become a subject matter expert for compulsory acquisition and relocation assessments. So I'm the officer of Effective Control. We've got a team, happy little team, of about seven or eight staff including property consultants, interior designers, project managers. I've got the unusual claim of being a real estate agent with a science degree and honours in business psychology. So there's not too many of those going around. Family have a lot of fun with it, all the cliches and all the insults and everything you'd expect. But I think it comes down to passion. I love commercial property, anything to do with buildings and clients and helping connect up commercial buildings and clients and It's been a fun journey. I started in 1997, ended up working for a multinational as an in-house project manager and BRM began in 2004. So that was in my 20s, took a little bit of a risk. A client was silly enough to take a risk on me and it's been a fun journey. I've been learning ever since. Well, you mentioned passion for the industry and for buildings and for real estate. Is that what gave you the confidence to take the leap and start BRM in the first place? I think it's that, but I think it's also, if I was to be honest, pretty green and pretty naive. I come from a business background. So my dad ran a small business. He was an insurance broker. He had about five up to 10 staff. And so around the family dinner table, there was always conversations. My mum was involved in the business. I think there's that background. And I think, as you say, you've got to do what you love. And studying science, I looked around psychology. It was fascinating. I've always been interested in people, but I think you know when it's not for you. I think you should listen to those sorts of internal dialogue. And for me, 
spent 20 years gravitating towards commercial property and working towards that outcome and just really sort of moving towards what I know and what I love. Were you the type of kid who was always looking for ways to start a little business and make some money? To some extent, yes. I think it was more of the sort of kid that watched everything and wondered where I'd fit in with it all. But yeah, I've always been fascinated with business, how it works, particularly people. I think it's the intersection between business and people that I find endlessly fascinating. Well, that leads me to my next question, because I want to know what the difference is between BRM and its competitors. And I'm guessing people is part of it, but love to hear your thoughts on that. So it's an interesting story. I was in a multinational for the first six years, and we had a number of projects. I was that odd jobs in-house project management contact. And one of the things we did was set up a new facility. There were lots of locations, that properties that needed input. And one thing I noticed was that as the client owner, you're passing through each point of contact. So on a journey that's typically real estate to design architect or drafting service to builder, there's IT involved, there's a removalist, often back to real estate at the end for a handover or dispute with the landlord, the outgoing landlord. And at every point, you're falling between the cracks as you're passing through. It was missing that service that streamlined and joined and communicated everything. And so the vision at the start was translated through. And when I finished at the multinational, one of my thoughts was there's got to be a better way. And so I created BRM with a vision of having a single point of contact and nothing's changed. The way we go about business, I guess, has changed. The the industry has certainly been under pressure and changed, but that single point of contact vision, it's interesting. I come back to that again and again, and that's at the core of what we do. That hasn't changed. I think for a lot of big competitors or big commercial real estate firms, they're able to provide that single point of contact for the full breadth of services when it comes to their really big clients that are spread across many buildings or many geographies. But for a smaller client, typically that client will get punted between the transaction person, the projects person, and whatever else services they need. So there isn't the ability to provide that single point of contact. Even even today is my sort of observation. What do you think? Very much so. I think smaller businesses, and again, back to my family background, I've got a passion for small business as well. I think the smaller businesses, anything from a couple hundred staff down, they can't really afford those resources or they don't know how to access and use those resources. So that's where we come in. But I would just push back a little bit on that, Darren. I don't want to have a go at anyone, not have a go at our competitors, but that true single point of contact from start to end, we would say that starts with strategy and what are you trying to achieve in the business and look at your um, facilities, how many you have and where they should be located and translate that all the way through a real world project. And that we handle the IT, we handle the move, we will talk to the staff about how to pack up and move because you've got to dismount your projects in a positive way. You know, everyone remembers the defects on a house that has a problem and those things stick in your head like splinters. So we don't want any of that sort of negative emotion associated with our project. And the best way to do that is to have control. So we run that from start to end. And that's all the way through to that handover and make good. So you'll see us getting involved with the IT and working with the IT consultant, the signage, the wayfinding. We want that experience to be positive start to end. So when it comes to providing the single point of contact, you have a background in projects before you started BRM, and then you've decided to also provide that seamless service, which includes handling the transaction. So how did you acquire the skills that are required to negotiate a lease and provide that end-to-end service to your clients in BRM? Great question. I guess when you start with a passion for the industry and you're looking in, for one thing, you've got a huge learning curve. I do wonder what it's like to go and study a degree in property. But at the same time, I guess I've picked up a lot of that knowledge along the way. There's a question of you don't know what you don't know. But we have a team and I rely on the team. So I would say all staff probably have a, a more trained than me formally. But it's that acquisition of knowledge. And so we rely heavily on education and our learning. And then it's really that determination, as well as assembling the team with all their skills so that we've got good overlap and a good sort of coverage of skill set. I've worked towards becoming that real estate agent, the officer in effective control. And it's actually an interesting, was an internal pain point because to go and get your degree or your license in Victoria, you've got to sit under someone. So we had a mentor. Northwood, who's fantastic. And I sat under his guidance for a couple of years and he transitioned the officer in effective control across to me and that allowed us to be licensed. And I learned a huge amount from Peter through that journey. Wonderful. Well, 17 years is a long time in business and 
as we were planning this episode, you mentioned to me that there have been plenty of highs and lows along the way. So I want to ask about the highs first. So what's one thing that you're most proud of achieving in the time that you've been running BRM? If you'll indulge me, I think I'll give you two. But sure. number one has to be a team. There's something amazing as I sit back and watch what's been built and really out of nothing. If I think back to 2004 and just getting going with an idea, pretty green, huge learning curve. And now I can watch staff go about delivering projects for clients. And it sounds funny, but I happily pay taxes because it tells me that where money is coming in, we're delivering projects, clients are paying us. And that sounds kind of strange, but to sit back and watch the whole thing run, it doesn't run without me. And that's an interesting question about systems and linchpins and things like that. But at the same time, just seeing it work and things progress and clients are happy and getting those emails occasionally from clients saying this staff member has done a fantastic job. I'm really proud of what's being created and that service we deliver and mentoring and passing that on to the team. The other one is, and I would never would have guessed this, it's very niche for our service, but being subject matter experts, so we give advice on Victoria's top tier infrastructure projects. So that's North East Link, Airport Rail, Suburban Rail, Melbourne Metro. I'm very passionate about Melbourne. I love this city. I think it's the best in the world. I don't like traffic. I hate traffic. I hate inefficiency. And for us to be able to be involved in these far-reaching, visionary infrastructure projects, we're just a very small part in the system. So where there is planning for a major project, there's businesses that are in the way. We provide advice to the Valuer General and the Department of Transport as to how to pick up that business, what the cost would be to re-establish it. We deal with forensic accountants and barristers, lawyers, claimants. And so we're responding to that. How much does it cost to re-establish this business somewhere else? And just to play our part in contributing to Melbourne and helping shape Melbourne's infrastructure, road and rail, that's quite special to me. Well, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. In your opinion, what's the toughest thing about running a business that you experience specifically as an owner that you wouldn't encounter as, say, if you were a paid managing director of an office that someone else owned? It's funny you ask that. I think real estate agents have this unique position where they're almost running their own business, their own brand within a company. You see names on the boards and I think about my journey as owning a business and I don't think it's too different to someone who's running their own brand. But the things that are on my mind, I was likening it to, you know, in the circus, the plate spinners and they're keeping all the plates moving, prospecting and pipeline cash flow. When the pipeline's full, I'm thinking about resources and how to attract and retain talent. Stepping back and letting the staff do what they do best. You're always putting out fires, profits, dealing with accounting, decision-making, keeping our reputation strong in the service systems and procedures. There's a huge range of things that's on a business owner's mind. And my wife runs a business as well. And I asked her this question, what keeps her up at night? I think we both agreed it's boundaries and discipline. It's that work-life balance. I've got two young girls. When they want me to read them a story in the evening and I'm thinking about that email, that project, I'm thinking about cash flow, I'm walking the floorboards in the middle of the night wondering how to unsolve a problem. They're the challenges, I think, when you're in your business, that how to have that discipline and set up the boundaries. And some are better than others. I don't think I'm great. I mentioned before, you know, I'm always learning. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm always willing to take advice. I think I could be a little bit better at those boundaries too. So I don't sit here and tell you that I've got all the answers, Darren, but they're definitely... Running a business is incredibly rewarding. You have control and flexibility, but with that flexibility and control, it's a double-edged sword and that balance is hard to get right. Has becoming a parent made you better at balancing those priorities? I think you're shifting in time and as your children get a little bit older, their needs shift a little as well. It goes from physical to mental. Our kids are now nine and 11. So there's, there's that sort of change and definitely butting heads last night. So I can tell you that <laughs> the challenges of children change. I think what it has done, it's funny. I was thinking about this the other day. I think it's helped me make decisions. It's helped me take accountability and because with children, you're constantly making decisions for someone else. And I don't babysit my staff in any way whatsoever, but there is a little bit of a correlation in the growing team, the questions you get asked. And you want your children to be independent and self-sufficient, and you want your staff to be independent and self-sufficient. And so I do see some parallels there. But in a funny way, there is a correlation between them. 
Well, one thing I admire about your business, Gab, is that you've carved out this niche where you work with clients that have similar values or maybe a like-minded approach to business as you and your team do. And I think that you've also been quite successful at developing loyalty amongst your client base. And I think client loyalty is a huge factor when it comes to being successful in commercial real estate and being able to have that with clients that you're happy to work with seems like hitting the jackpot. So I want to ask you, what's your secret or your strategy to achieving that level of satisfaction with clients, but also having those clients be aligned with your own and your team's values? That's really nice of you to say that, Darren. I appreciate that, especially you get that view. We work really hard with our clients and I think some of these, we're very values driven and I think we know who we are and what we're good at. And I think we attract clients that resonate. I would imagine there's a lot of clients out there who look at us, look at our website, who I've met in the past and they say, that's not for me. And that's no problem. We're not trying to be something for everyone. And so maybe if you know what you stand for and you know who you are, you're like a moth to a flame. You're attracting like attracts like. But it's interesting, the fit-out industry is notorious for churn. There is an opportunity, how to say this right? There's the client comes to you, they're very smart, they're very educated, but not in our industry. And so I have seen companies in the past, particularly some design and constructs that have fallen over that were probably a little guilty of taking advantage of the client when the client was unaware. And I looked at that business model right at the start. And I want to be as far away from that as possible. And so I think it's about how you add value, how you assist your client through the process. And if you do what you promise and you excel and you go beyond what they're expecting and you're adding value at every point, then I think they will come back again and again. So we take that long-term view, at least could be five years. If you've got an option, it's five plus five. You may not see that client for 10 years. We're still talking to them. We're still adding value through them. We take that long-term view of, we don't have a rent roll, for example, not property managers, but I view the lease as almost like a rent roll. If you can fill it with a pipeline of happy, stable clients who keep coming back, then I think long-term, you've got a good sound business model. Well, you mentioned Melbourne and you're here in Melbourne as am I, and we had a difficult year in 2020 with a long and quite strict lockdown. Did you do anything different or new to stay connected with your clients over the past year? We did. I don't know how different what we did was, but I'm going to get in trouble here, but I do want to say something because it bugs me. So the Property Council of Australia, we were members. We'll probably be members again. I've just put it on hold because I'm a little frustrated, but I'm willing to say this on the record. They were charging for webinars. They were charging for attending. So in Melbourne, I guess worldwide, there was around March, April, it's like, the ground opened up and we all fell in and you just didn't know where stable ground was as business owners, as employees. We're worried, we're scared. We didn't know what Corona would mean and where this was all going to land. And so I felt intuitively, this is where you help. This is where you stand up and you communicate to your clients and you ask them how they're going and you listen to their problems. And so the property council were charging for their webinars and I sent them an email and I said, hey, it's $50 to go to a webinar. You're not putting any food on here. You know, if you're going to get a couple of hundred people coming along every time, because you can see the numbers on their webinars, are you sure you want to be charging? You know, shouldn't this be a service? Shouldn't you be a beacon for information and light and guiding all your clients when we're all really scared and we're all really worried about what's going on? I got that typical email back, which is we value your feedback. Thank you very much, blah, blah, blah. But I think in truth, they just wanted to give their business model and their funding coming through. I understand they've got economic pressures. We all did, but we took the opposite approach. And so we ran webinars. We ran a series of six. I'd like to think they have value. I think you came to one, Darren. I picked up the phone and I rang every single one of our clients repeatedly, just every month or two. How are you going? How can we help? There was no suggestion of charging for any of that. It was just, where you stand with the code of conduct and the lease? Do you need any help? And so there must have been three to six months where we were simply just holding our client's hand. I'd like to think that comes back to us, that goodwill, but it wasn't driven out of a, oh, we'll get something out of this in 2021 or 2022. I think it was about people were in pain and we knew something about the industry. We had an opinion on it and we felt like we had skills that we could help with. And so we tried to share that knowledge. Do you think anything's changed for the long term in terms of how we dealt with 2020 and how we 
build and maintain client relationships in the future? I hope we don't get back to the way it was. I hope we all learn something. I think personally, I don't know about you, but I'm seeing a lot of change around family, friends and in the industry. I'm seeing a lot of people changing jobs, looking at their life, saying maybe life is short and that's not for me. I'd like to think those things, maybe Corona is a catalyst and it's helping us make decisions a little quicker. I've certainly seen a clean out in the industry and that happened the GFC around a little bit for the dot-com boom in 2000, early 2000s. And so I think Corona is one of those opportunities for a clean out and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think the people who are passionate and see the vision and want to stay involved in the industry will find their way through. For us, I can tell you that our business model has streamlined and cleaned up a little bit. A little bit of pain last year, but we now know a little bit stronger who we are and that service we provide. So it's been that kick that we needed as well. A bit of a thinning down for an economic winter last year. And here we are, the industry is starting to get going with a little bit of confidence this year, which is nice to see. Let's switch gears to leadership in general. And in your role leading a team, what does leadership mean to you? What does leadership mean to me? It's an interesting one. I've probably learned a lot about leadership in the last 12 months. We had a slight change in director structure, a little bit painful, a little bit of introspection. And so I've been thinking, studying, watching that leadership and role models, particularly the last 15 months. I think we know good and bad leadership when we see it. I think the world is and was under pressure. And so you see people behaving in certain ways. I think we intuitively know poor leadership. It's hard to define good leadership. And I think we can get confused a little bit between charisma and leadership. And that's an interesting question around why people follow. But I've got an interesting role. We're client side. And so I meet with a lot of CEOs. I think over the years, hundreds of CEOs and decision makers that I've met with and mentioned before, you know, I love watching people and understanding what makes people tick. So just that benefit of sitting in front of so many leaders and watching how they go about it, you know, good, bad, and the ugly, and I've seen it all. And if I think about good leaders and the qualities they have, I think they're honest and fair. They communicate clearly, consistent decision-making. They're decisive leaders. They take risks, but they're informed and calculated risk. I think vision and purpose, value-driven, not necessarily extroverts. I think sometimes we can confuse good loud leaders and that's not necessarily the case but some of the best leaders I've worked with are introverts I think they care they care about their staff in the context of business the good leaders listen I think assembling a team and curating a team and rewarding them not just financially but with helping their staff grow and dealing with conflict as well good leaders are probably generous with their money as well as their time it's amazing it's an interesting thing Darren you know the higher up you go in the corporate tree as in the people you deal with. I don't know whether it's a tall poppies, you know, mentality in Australia, but I find it's the opposite. The higher you go in a corporate structure, I actually find that people get better caliber and they're more generous with their time and their true qualities shine through. So it's almost as though the cream rises to the top in a corporate structure, I believe. I think it usually it does. And that's a, a reflection of a good organization, right? Because that's where the cream should be right at the top. Gab, there may be a listener who's listening to you and the fact that you've been able to be true to your values and they may be inspired to start their own business and do it their own way as well. So I want to close with a couple of questions on behalf of that listener. What should someone ask themselves before they start a business? And what's a big lesson that you've learned along the way? Yeah, a couple of things. Do it. If that's the direction you want to go, you get control and flexibility over your life, which are amazing things. You get to live and die by your own sword. So you can really prove your worth, but it's fantastically rewarding running your own business, but there's challenges as well. So I think if someone had pulled me aside at the start and they said, what's the secret? Tell me a few things that are important. I think goal setting, knowing your high level goals, what you're trying to achieve and why, knowing yourself, goal setting is really important, but you've got to be aligned with your stakeholders. That's essential because Darren, is you know, when you set goals, you often achieve them. So they've got to be the right goals for the right reasons. And then it goes on and on. Resilience, you've got to be determined. Profit, again, in Australia, we're a bit reluctant to talk about money. But if you run a business and you aren't making a decent profit, you're not a business owner. The business owns you. And there's a real trap for business owners in that if you're doing something because you're passionate about it, you're giving it an incredible amount of time. But if you can earn that 
working for someone else? Why are you running your business? So I think it's essential that you prioritize profit. There's endless decision making. You've got to understand the importance of systems in a business. I think you have to learn to outsource and work with consultants. I want to talk briefly about mental health. I think I don't believe mental health is binary as in it's a one or zero. I think these days I'm looking at mental health as a spectrum and you can be at a different point on it in a different day of the week. And I think business owners need to talk more and understand more about mental health and general health is tied up with mental health. There's this thing called the double helix trap, which is sales and prospecting. Darren, I'm sure you can appreciate this. When you're busy doing sales and prospecting, then you get a bit light on the delivery, especially if you're a one-man band. And then when you're delivering, it's hard to prospect and secure those sales pipelines. So that's that trap of oscillating between the two parts of a business. And it's quite funny. If I think about everything, if I think about the most important thing, if I could distill it down to one thing. And honestly, Darren, this is not a setup with you listeners, but it's really mentors and guidance. And you know, BRM, we've got a coach that helps us with our systems and procedures. We've got our strategic accountant that helps us understand the profit and the direction of the company financially. But I think it's no secret, CRE success is helping bear in projects with our pipeline, with our client base, with our how we go about building that pipeline. And I think that guidance and mentorship, it's that old thing of you don't know what you don't know. And so a consultant, a coach has that worldview, top down, has a look, tells you where your business needs to tweak and tune up and there's accountability. And I think if I had my time again, I'm probably, I could have fast tracked my learning curve by keeping company with people who were willing to help and that should be paid. I think that isn't free advice from your friend because that's dangerous sometimes, that kind of advice. So it's who you keep company with. With that mentoring, it's also that accountability to learn. So you should be a lifelong learner. I've got an Audible account. I'm listening to books, podcasts, this kind of podcast. I'm hoovering up all that kind of information. You should be reading books. And I think that comes back to passion as well. If you're passionate about what you do, you probably want to learn a little bit more. But like I say, it's not a setup, but I genuinely think mentoring is essential to business growth and development. Well, Gab, I think that our listeners today have really gotten a lot from what you've had to say, a different perspective from a business owner, someone who's coming at things from a slightly different angle, but certainly with the knowledge and expertise in our industry. I do appreciate what you've just said about the CRE success as well. That wasn't a setup. I didn't know you were going to do that. (laughs) But look, thank you for being so open and willing to share on this episode of CRE Success, the podcast. It's been great to have you. Thank you, Darren. Can I step out of the lift now? You can. (laughs) Watch your step. Thank you. For more information about our guest, visit CREsuccess.co forward slash podcast. And now a final thought from Darren Krakowiak. Nearly time to wrap up today's episode. But before we do, I just wanted to say, I really hope you're enjoying season two, a little bit different to season one. Of course, there is a whole back catalogue of episodes to enjoy if you are recently finding CRE Success, the podcast, and we'd love for you to listen to that. And also, if you like the content that we're presenting, I would love it if you would take a moment to rate this podcast. You can give us a five-star rating and that will help even more people discover this content. So if you can do that for us, if there's a way that you can give something back, it's really simple. Just click that five-star rating button and it would be much appreciated. Thanks so much for listening and I will speak to you soon. Thanks for listening to CRE Success, the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and be sure to leave us a five-star review. For more information about the show, just check the show notes on your podcast app or visit us online at cresuccess.co. 90% of the world's data was generated in the last two years. Credia is a business intelligence and analytics tool for commercial real estate professionals. Using real-time insights, track key portfolio metrics and benchmark against the market so you can make faster and well-informed decisions. With live dashboards and bespoke reporting, impress both your executive team and your property clients. It's time to turn data into your most valuable asset with Credia from Released.